Okay, we are live. Hello, uh, Green Apple audience out there in TV land. I'm going to be uh, a little bit psychically frazzled. I hit a flat tire on the way in, so I'm a little bit uh, uh, more adrenaline-y than I normally am, but I will do my best to calm down. Uh, as usual, we're gonna start with uh, uh, some announcements and housekeeping type stuff, and then we will turn it over to our guests for the night. Uh, so, um, first things first, some upcoming events you might be interested in. On May 14th, we have Kristen Hirsch discussing her book, Seeing Sideways. Picking up in 1990, a few years after her first memoir, Rat Girl, which deals with her rise in the band Throwing Muse, this new memoir covers difficult years. She battles for the custody of her first son, has a second, and against the backdrop of a protracted legal battle with her record label, goes into a period of deep writer's block. She will be joined in the evening in conversation uh, with Black Francis of the Pixies. Uh, then on May 26th, in partnership with Lit Quake, we'll have a round table discussion with local heavy hitters, Gary Camilla, John Law, Kimberly Rays, and Alia Volz to discuss the essay collection, The End of the Golden Gate, Writers on Loving and Sometimes Leaving San Francisco. Over the last few decades, San Francisco has experienced radical changes with the influence of Silicon Valley, tech companies, and more. Countless articles, blogs, and even movies have tried to capture the complex nature of what San Francisco has become, a place millions of people have loved to call home and yet are compelled to consider leaving. In this writer's take on Bay Area dwellers' eternal conflict, should I stay or should I go? Uh, all right, so that brings us to tonight's event. So uh, out there on the streams, um, we uh, have started keeping our chat window open, so feel free to use that, but uh, keep it polite or I will kick you on out. Um, with that said, I've never really had any issues with people with poetry readings being impolite, so that's kind of a useless warning. <laughs> Um, one thing, at the end of uh, the program, we are going to have a question and answer session. Uh, and we do request, if you do that, that you drop your questions into the Q&A box. Um, on computers, it looks like two little speaking bubbles. If you're on a mobile phone or something, it might be in the uh, ellipsis menu somewhere. Um, yeah, so go ahead and drop your questions in throughout the reading and uh, I'll check in with the authors um, towards the end and we'll do a little session. So that brings us to tonight's guests, Peter Filkins, whose latest book is titled, <laughs> titled, sorry, titled Water Music, uh, roughly on the topic of nature and culture. The poems of water music anchor themselves in the timely and the timeless. Rich and diverse in their formal intimacy, they move with ease from narrative to meditation, from close physical observation to the haunts of memory and from lyric sorrows to the pleasure of living in the world. Uh, here in conversation, we are with Rosanna Warren, whose latest uh, book is called So Forth uh, Poems. With irony and mourning tinged with eros, one of our most extraordinary poets blends the personal and the political to meditate on damage, aging and injustice. The poems and so forth surge back in memory, pondering guilt and forgiveness. Consciousness flows from singular to plural. Identity in these poems does a round dance with other personae, with formidable women artists of the past in the powerful sequence, Legend of Good Women, with pre-Socratic philosophers and with lovers, children, and strangers, the strangest of whom is the face in the mirror. So tonight we're gonna to be starting with Peter, and second, we will have Rosanna. So I'm going to uh, silence and check out here and let the poets take the stage. Great, thank you, Devin. Uh, and uh, it's wonderful to be reading uh, at Green Apple Books uh, from uh, all the way from across the country. And I'm in Western Massachusetts, kind of a remarkable thing that, that this can take place. Uh, it's also as ever a delight to read with uh, Rosanna Warren. Um, and uh, 
especially to hear her wonderful poems uh, from so forth, this marvelous book that she brought out uh, a year ago. I'll be reading primarily from my new book, Water Music. There's a slash between the two words. And of course, you can see uh, Michael Zalachowski's uh, artwork, which he was so kind to loan to us for use on the cover. Um, the title of his piece is Thousand Year Stare, uh, and it's actually constructed out of detritus from a Florida hurricane. So it too is a kind of combination of the forces of nature and the forces of culture. And that is that slash that I'm kind of, uh, uh, that borderline that I'm interested in investigating uh, in the collection. Uh, between uh, culture and history and, and the solace of nature. Uh, around us. Um, when we get to culture and history, we often uh, are in, unfortunately in matters of suffering and uh, duress. And the first section of the book kind of touches upon those subjects. In fact, I'll start with the first poem, which is called In Vivo, which means carried out within the body or ex um, experimented, if you will, even uh, within the body. It's a short poem, In Vivo. Suffering knows what cannot heal the self embedded in the pain of pain. And, and so continues unrestrained, lancing the mind that won't let go. The bloodied self alone sustained by sharper knowledge, suffering knows. Um, I, in the first section I write, about the, the world immediately around us, often things that happen in the headlines. Uh, it's a poem called Nobody's Road, which unfortunately speaks to the many unfortunate uh, shootings, mass shootings in this country. It was, um, I hate to use the word inspired, but it was set in motion by the shootings at Sandy Hook back in 2012, uh, which deeply moved me. And I thought if there was any chance of uh, change in gun re regulation that would take place then, but alas, uh, has never happened. Nobody's road. Nobody knows what troubled the kid. Nobody even knew where he lived. Nobody remembers hearing a thing. Nobody considered inquiring. Nobody thought to call the police. Nobody worried it would come to this. Nobody can say how he got inside. Nobody knows yet how many died. Nobody can think of just what to do. Nobody can help but feel deja vu. Nobody agrees how to prevent it. Nobody wants their rights suspended. Nobody can fathom the depth of such grief. Nobody is sure just what to believe. Nobody can undo what has been done. Nobody is watching the neighbor's son. Uh, a third poem from that first section is actually uh, a section of a, of a longer poem called Triptych. Um, and it's a poem titled uh, To the Eminent Hate Mongers. I never thought I would find myself in a position of wanting to dedicate the reading of a poem to uh, Liz Cheney, uh, but she's had a day of it. And uh, I'll be, I'll be it, perhaps with a dollop of irony, uh, I will uh, mention, dedicate uh, the reading of this poem to her tonight. This was written in the summer of 2016 as the election was uh, ratcheting up, I worried then that the poem would be dated and uh, would quickly sort of seem something of the past, but unfortunately that is not proven true and I think still seems as relevant today. To the eminent hate mongers. I too have wandered in the provinces of blame, climbed the heady peaks of disdain, to breathe the bellicose air of mockery. They, them, you, and us, the fertile seals of lush resentment, sprouting its fruits and grains and hothouses of malice, overheated incubators, oxygenating through the night, the artificial blossoms of fear, the fibrous roots of treachery. Ah, such satisfaction, and how very sweet the taste of dime store righteousness. Who knew it could feel this pleasurable? Whole counties chugging sudsy drafts of smug, oak-aged vintages of anger following hard on the heels of those tasty distractions. 
bitterness and spite, the flourishing and succulent harvest of hate ripened on smears. Yet remember, friends, remember, beware the curse of language. Its deft perversions, once unleashed, returned, return always and ever to eradicate all who consume them, poisoning you, they, them, and us, until the very smell of knowledge or conviction or simple decency is enough to sicken, enough to cramp and royal and wretch whatever is left of the gutted truth that will undo you, showing up one day in the duchy of triumph, there inside the tower of cynicism, at the resplendent ego's banquet, where softly afoot and on supple tawny hands your heaping plates will be carried in, the cook announcing with a smile as sharp and bright as the grudge he harbors. Ladies and gentlemen, come to the table. It's time to eat your meal. Um, <clears throat> I often say you can't live too long in that kind of space in poetry. The second section sort of moves more inward, more towards a, uh, an inner emotional landscape of duress or, or struggle. Uh, I'll read four poems from that section and they need no setup. I'll just read the titles and, and they're uh, uh, rather short poems in themselves. The first one, Obad, which is a morning song. Obad, the seagull kiting in a cage of wind navigates again its scry of need. Beyond the docks, the wooden boats, rough barbs, buoying flight toward an end to flight and gravity riding the wind. Willow. Amid the toss of light that rakes the rust of oak, pearl gray cloud cover bellying rain, the willow lingers, pliant with weeping that is not there and yet is what we know it by, among hemlock, among ash, beside the lake water that laps the rocky shore as a heron unfolds its pageant slate above the surface, rippling bruise. Credo. Never complain, the jonquils say, blousy with breeze they cannot hold and the breeze itself, saturated, cold, dispenses torrents, a black cloud drained to quick exhaustion, and the marauded plain of jonquils blazoned, never complain. And finally, nocturne. Suffice it to say, the full moon's hard light exposing the ambush of sea invading the harbor, cannot know the concerted blast that cripples an elm to a stack of limbs. Suffice it to say, and say it, to praise the burnished horizon, its collar of rust, suppliant above the sea's reckless glitter, these meager stars piercing the scrim of moonlight proffered its silver its peace. <clears throat> the third section returns to history, but in a different fashion, taking up uh, the work of artists, um, some ekphrastic poems, and also uh, elegies to other poets who have meant a great deal to me. Uh, it's a poem uh, called Water Lilies, and indeed it's about uh, Claude Monet in 1917, painting the great uh, series of water lilies that he later uh, uh, donated to the French state after the war. And he was only per perhaps 40, 50 miles from the front lines of World War I uh, and the bombardment that he could hear there. And in his 80s, that's what Monet did during World War I was to stay in his studio and paint the water lilies. Water lilies. Meanwhile, he painted them. Lilies floating on the surface of a pond he'd constructed for the pleasure of the eye and motifs to paint at century's end. The new one begun with multiple explosions of carmine, 
coral, white fleshy flowers against the backdrop of a subsurface blue with distances. The sky stretched out upon the watery calm where a cloudy puff would later be captured by his brush in motion. Each day in the studio, another one spent to the echo of guns bombarding the trenches, pummeling the sun, erupting in billows of, <coughs> excuse me, erupting in billows of char black smoke beyond a horizon, no longer present, but subsumed, erased, immersed as he was, in the flux of light on water, flowers astride turbid shallows beneath a willow and its weeping, our only perspective in a lost world lost to bottomless translucency, the eye that sees it and the intractable sun. Uh, it's a poem called Sun Through Snow, which came to me, I was on a writing residency in, in Ireland a couple of years ago, looked out my window and saw what looked like a, a painting by J.M.W. Turner, one of these great uh, washes of light and energy. And what it was, was the sun coming through a snow squall um, over a lake uh, in the countryside and immediately sat down to, to write the poem. It's the only time I've ever written a poem in real time. It took about an hour to draft it. And as I looked up, I was, as I was finishing it, the squall was gone. Um, and it was uh, <clears throat> quite extraordinary to have the poem and the event line up uh, almost exactly. Sun through snow. Turner could have done no better, nor did he, articulating the light made now radiant, prismatic, hills, lake, trees, and woolen sky filtered by this sun-threaded squall of snow as real, as veneration, the smell of rain, the heft of stone, or the thought that within an hour it will be gone, the veer and waft and thrust of clouds and light electric with the backlit pulse and shimmer of each ray of snow consigned to memory and weather closing down this moment's glow. Uh, third section return, turns to nature, and yet I think melds <coughs> the um, residue of culture that we find within nature um, through things like global warming or even the violation of nature that, that we uh, sometimes enact upon it. Uh, it's a poem called False Cardinal. It was written in Stonington, Connecticut, where I was when I was lucky enough to be a fellow at the James Merrill House. And that spring we had no snow. And that winter we had no snow. And uh, off of Merrill's balcony for two or three weeks and three weeks early was a red cardinal chirping uh, each night. And as much as it was a beautiful song, I realized it was three weeks early. And that itself was a kind of bad omen for uh, the state of nature or even climate change. <coughs> Excuse me, false cardinal. Just before sunset, a cardinal sets its doo-wop chirp chirp atop an elm, a knot of flame like an epithet inside the evening sky blue dome. Spring again, the cardinals return now three weeks early, Revenant of a future we've come to learn, we'll see the planet dead and spent, or not, or maybe so, while likely the cardinal's song, undulant still in its late day last call reveille, will find us at evening, facing west, transfixed and emblazoned, a cardinal sun sinking in each pane of glass. Uh, I live on a lake in Western Massachusetts and have all my life and as a boy found arrowheads on the shore of the lake and have two of them that uh, sit uh, in, in the drawer, central drawer of my desk um, and have had them my entire life <clears throat> and decided to write about that uh, unfortunately disappeared world, right, disappeared culture and its presence uh, still here or at least to try to pay honor to that presence. Arrowhead. Flint point planted in moraine gravel, each beveled chink a milk gray ghost. Mohawk? Mohegan? 
There is no nation to water's chuffed sun-voweled surface, or the indolent trout a shine and spotted, as an arrow aims, shoots, pierces, wild hunger gutted in the silver sheen of limp wet fish, the chalk dry taste of history in the arrowhead that lies askant my narrow desk. Uh, and then, how's my time? I want to keep track of that. Uh, in the third section, uh, the, the last section uh, begins actually with a, uh, a quote from Theodore Rutherford's notebooks, which says, if there is not another life, there is at least another way to live. And the last section, I think, tries to take up that way of living through making, and if you will, through writing um, or through observing the world and trying to make something out of it. Uh, <clears throat> first poem in that section is, is uh, simply called Writings. Swallows at daybreak, pure in violet sounds, the flit and splutter of their antic rounds across lake glass, dipping their tails mid-flight and lambent, translucent inkwells left pooled and pooling toward the outer shore, a water-pocked trail, their signature. It's a poem called uh, Making Hay, which is actually an elegy for uh, Richard Wilbur, who was a dear friend, lived uh, only about a half an hour away from where I live and used to love to go see him. And across the road from uh, his house was a farm. And so if you went to Wilbur's house in the summer, you often were greeted with the smell of hay wafting in from across the fields. Um, and it's a smell that I, I love, <clears throat> making hay. Dotting a fresh mown pasture, they are abstracted. Lozenges of green whose yield will feed a winter's hunger with a summer's field. For now, they sit there, circumspect and salient, as totems to another time whose sickles and sighs seeded the baler's tines, this sun-baked stubble plain of timothy and fescue configured with each pass, summer materialized in cylinders of grass. Yet, absent the sharp inflections of blade on polished home, is there really any loss? Or is it dim nostalgia denying is for was? For it's hang that remains, patient, mindful husbandry, never quite out of style, so long as the scent of clover still carries a country mile to circulate among us, lost to screens and pixels, the freshet of this summer day, sweet with its own idiom, the musk green smell of hay. And then finally, the last poem, uh, Envoy, which is really a poem about driving. Uh, I commute to college and <clears throat> it's a long way and I've driven a lot of miles in my life. And so has my poet friend, Abbott Cutler, to, um, to whom uh, the, the poem is dedicated, Envoy. A burl of light on a pane glass window, cold drizzle, wet snow, eruptive weather. And this our only legacy to know the low hung cloud that glances off a mirrored surface yet more real than the cloud itself. Muddy April, indecisive to the last, mimicking the slap of wipers back and forth across the slope of windshield, or oddly, at the corner of Maine and North, that storefront window reflecting now the curve of heaven, the noxious exhaust, pedestrians astride the polished glass, the cars rolling by, the dog on its leash. Thanks very much. Rosanna. Thank you, Peter. It's just uh, <laughs> lovely to read with you. And thanks to Green Apple Books. Uh, thanks to Devin for your hospitality. I'm going to read uh, first some books from, from poems from the new book, uh, so forth, and then some new, new poems that aren't in any book yet. Um, Diamonds. At midnight, the jewelry store mannequins proffer their bare necks, headless, 
torso-less, just the swoop of collarbone and upper chest with a meager swelling toward breasts in chill streetlight. Now they've achieved purity. Now without distracting diamonds or the small polluted algae pools of emeralds, they soar. Love is a theorem. And what we proved, not what we paid for through the ATMs, keep spitting out bills and a rat-a-tat-tat of chattering teeth. In those pictures you took, the thigh carves a perfect arc against the thicket at the mouth of the cave, and flesh pleats illegibly. If it's a god who touches us when we lose ourselves, he's the briefest of flashbulbs. The image cannot endure. I shone in your arms blindly. Blindly you cried out in the electrochemical light. We leave a burn on the air. Morning holds us, morning with crinkled eyelids, abdominal creases and enlarged pores. Gingerly, we test our heaviness, feet on the floor. Gingerly, we hold our balance on this spinning crust of soil. Um, and then um, here's a poem uh, of uh, recognizing one's ever looming and ever, ever possible mortality. Uh, more or less speeded up. Scenic view. The poster in the doctor's office proposes Eden, varicose peonies tilting over a lapis lazuli pool. Blossoms lush, carnal and tipsy as aging courtesans. We are not to take seriously the stainless steel. Technicians murmur incantations. I obey these priests. I disrobe as instructed. In the inner sanctum, the ultrasound reveals black and white galaxies, a swirl in my breast. Streams of stars, dazed planets, a loose comet here and there. When the high priestess moves her wand, the night sky heaves like Atlantic swells. I must have said unknowingly the right prayers. The dangerous stars have receded. The gods grant me, it seems, a few more years. And I walk with you again along the lake where dim waves jitter at the breakwater and soiled, piled up, Chunks of ice begin to melt, and the crumbling masonry of the balustrade retains its air of raffish gentility. We call this safety. Here we may stroll. Here we may pause and look out over the deep. Um. Oh. Uh. Uh, yes, here, here's a, an urban scene, um, also haunted by a bit of danger. <laughs> well, life is haunted by danger, big and little, private and public. Eclipse. When we went looking for that eclipse of the moon in mid-Manhattan, we turned dizzied by silhouettes of towers and thought the moon was swallowed by hulking walls. Only when we headed home did she appear, rusted, a trace of menstrual red, half erased in her own ghostly blood. Like the scraps of poems tapped to the screen porch wall of a summer cottage. After a winter of snow, wind, and rain lash, they delivered themselves shyly, ink muted, letters drained of sense, in phantom script still held in, 
whispered, God is near and hard to grasp, but where danger rises grows what saves. But what did we know of saving? Yes, and here's a longer perspective in time. Rosh Hashanah. It wasn't competition, the way you unwrapped your father's ram's horn from its velvet case and carried it out to the walkway as wind drove scalloping crests up the East River and rain slammed high-rise windows and drove pools scudding across the pavement. It wasn't only your breath that filled your lungs and pressed out that floating whale as cars poured in liquefied pearl and ruby light along FDR Drive. A breath of grandfathers and fathers, fathers, fathers rushed through you and stuttered in bursts over ragged waves and night licked at you, but still you blew. The practice for tomorrow means letting the past surge through. You closed your eyes, you pressed your lips against the twisted horn. Poland and Russia went keening under the Queensboro Bridge in three short blasts, then one long cataract summoning souls. Your hair shone like seaweed and your glasses streamed. The book of life would open. It would be a new year. We tasted its newness. We were drenched, dark, alone, and small. Um, let's see. Uh, I did get quite fascinated by the pre-Socratic philosophers uh, in these last few years. Um, Heraclitus I've been reading since I was a teenager, like a lot of people, but uh, then I got friendly with um, Anaximander, Place. So here's an Anaximander poem. That the earth is suspended. As Scylla prinks purple from half thawed clods, and the cardinal flings his ribbon of song in two high arcs, then trails the vibrato among the boughs, May unclenches, but not enough. Buds grip fetal leaves. Each night scatters frost. On sidewalks, we tread on broken sky. You are sick and far away. The world is in flux, said Anaximander. Worlds are born, appear, and disappear. We perish, even the gods fade. Spare me the industrial daffodils poking through scraps of snow. The season will have its hard birth and we will be dragged into light. For how many years has that ill corroded your gut? Whirlwinds, typhoons break out of the cloud. The tearing makes thunder, the crack against black makes the flash. So natural philosophy began. You watched glaciers slide and crash at the tip of the earth. You floated on a rope into ice crevasses to catch the gleam and the groan. I sculpted the planet and sculpts it still. You hammered aluminum into that shape. The stars are a wheel of fire broken off from earth fire surrounded by air. We came from the unlimited, to it we return. So taught Anaximander of Miletus, who thought we would be destroyed. Um, that poem has uh, every day as we, the planet heats up and up and up, I think more and more Anaximander was quite right. Um, here are just a few new ones, and then we will break and hear from you, I hope. 
small dead snake. As when I approached what I feared and didn't want to see, that snake curled where it died struggling in the glue trap set for mice. And I cried out and twisted my hands, but returned to take up the trap with gloved fingers, tipped it into a plastic bag and carried it to the woods on a shovel and dug a hole in dense root woven earth, buried it, then looked up where tall leafy branches of beech and oak carded strands of cloud. So I tried to ease with both hands, gently out of my chest, my fears for you, my stories about what I feared for you and tried to lift the stories free to place them out of sight beyond the grasp of my belief, beyond horror, but not beyond knowing what traps I had set for you, for me. Um, I think I'll just I'll just read uh, two more. Burning the bed. Carefully, you balanced the old mattress against the box spring to create a teepee on that frozen December patch behind the house. Carefully, you stacked cardboard hollow and touched the match to corners till flame crawled along the edges in a rosy smudge before shooting 25 feet into darkening air. Fire gilded each looming shadowed tree, gilded our faces as we stood with shovel and broom to smack down sparks. So much old love going up in smoke. It stung our eyes, our lungs. Pagodas, terraces, domes, boudoirs flared, shivered and crumpled as the light caved in. Privacies curled to ash wisp, towers toppled where once we'd warmed each limb, fired each nerve, ignited each surprise. And now at dusk, our faces reddened in heat so artfully lit, we needed all that past, I thought, to face the night. And I'll conclude with a poem that came out last week on Poem A Day. Also set deep in nature, but also you might say in politics. Boletus. Crickets are stitching the afternoon together. What the squalling catbird rends, crickets relentlessly repair. The maple shivers, sends yellowed messages sailing down. Too much has ripped. Half the main branch cracked off and hangs teetering across lower boughs, leaving on the trunk a blonde wound. We cross the brook on stepping stones and climb west up the mountain flank through laurel thickets. Along the scooped out valley of beaches up the stream bed to sit on a fallen tree. But there's no rest. We carry with us what we left below. A country clawing its very idea to shreds. The scarlet boletus mushroom prongs from decaying wood. In its bishop's amaranth skull cap, it stands its ground. One kind will nourish, the other sickens, but not like the white amanita bringing on liver failure, seizures, death. And on that cheerful note, I thank you all for being here. <laughs> all right, thank you very much, Peter and Rosanna. That was all this great material. Um, all right, so we're gonna transition into question and answer here. Again, so audience, uh, if you have questions, drop them into the Q&A and uh, 
we'll, we'll take them. So uh, usually I like to start question and answer with just um, asking about your processes, you know, like uh, from a very basic standpoint, for example, like uh, what part of the day do you like to write or um, do your poems happen in fits and starts or do they happen all in chunks or uh, uh, from that kind of a micro all the way to the macro to like how you consider putting together um, entire collections or bodies of work, you know, how do you know when the thing is done? Uh, that sort of thing. Um, I, I'll jump in. Uh, I, I write, I find I write in spurts. I teach. So um, when I'm teaching, it's very difficult to, to uh, write new poems, I find, unless something uh, just comes along to me. Um, I have found writing residencies to be extremely useful to my process because I go away and though I live in a quiet place in the countryside here, I find it uh, useful to have nothing to do but to, to focus on poems and reading, reading poems and generating poems. I actually try to leave the residency with as many unfinished poems as possible, meaning I don't try to perfect poems, I just try to generate them and that frees me to go many different places. Um, and then I end up, as I think was evident, I, I end up writing about many different kinds of things, whether it's history or something in the news or uh, a painting or something in nature or something in my own experience. So the hard work of a book is to try to fit all those things together in some coherent fashion. I find sections in a book to be very a very useful way to kind of manage uh, the material in that. And as far as when I write, I. I get up in the morning, I, I, I'm just ready to go um, and can be there for four or five, six hours um, and I'm happy to be. So. Yeah. Sorry, Devin, I didn't hear the question because I had to run across the room and make sure that the hotspot was really plugged in and providing internet. We, we are, I am in the mountains in the Catskills in a very remote mountain place. And in fact, it's a miracle if anyone heard me at all. I, ho I hope you <laughs> okay. did hear me. And Oh yeah, good. Yeah. That's yeah, no, a miracle. We we got a couple of uh, dramatically uh, digitally stretched words, but I actually kind of <laughs> enjoyed that in a way. <laughs> yeah, so it's just a general question about your process, uh, both from the micro and the macro. Micro being, you know, like when do you like to write? Uh, how do poems come up for you? Do you tend to work in fits and starts or big chunks? And on the macro, things like how you think about organizing a, a book of poems. Mm. you know how you feel like you're you've got a set together uh, that that kind of thing yeah well it depends i'm sure this is true for any any writer it depends what what uh phase of life you're in mm. so when i was when i had young children or even teenagers and dying parents uh and teaching full time um if I could get five minutes to go down to the laundry room and with a load of laundry in my notebook, throw the laundry in the washing machine and sit down on the stone cellar floor with my back to the washing machine and my notebook held against my knees and write for five minutes or jot down notes, that was good. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and that's part of my process for years <laughs> but of course yes um there were summers and some time off here or there and yes uh fighting for fighting for every moment um but um as children grow up <laughs> and move away and live their own life uh more or less uh there's a little more time for for things um and so or so in so in privileged and blessed blessed say academic summers um um i can uh, read a lead a vita contemplativa and wake up in the morning and and, and sit with my notebooks and, and cogitate for hours on end, um, which I love to do. Um, it looks as if you're not doing anything. Uh, you know, the, the, the um, <laughs> Yeats's great poem, Adam's Curse, where the, you know, the idler, the, 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 the bankers, schoolmasters and clergymen think the poet is just idling. Um, but, you know, Yeats says, we're, you know, we're working harder than you. Um, <laughs> um, but anyway, uh, I would say that um, about so-called process, um, 
I, I trained as a painter for years and years. I, I from childhood on and into my early 20s, I went to art schools, serious art schools. I, I worked many hours a day drawing and painting. And I still regard writing as a kind of drawing. I write by hand in a notebook. Um, I revise and revise and revise. Um, the script is really important to me, the feel of the paper, the feel of a pen, um, the scribbles all over the page. It become, it's a kind, it's very graphic for me. It's only late in the process that I type it into um, what is now not, no longer a typewriter, but a, uh, a computer. Yeah, I, I will second that, just the, the bodily feel of the, of the poem, poem coming out of the hand and just the, the fear, sheer physicality of, of writing on the page is absolutely vital. I wouldn't, I wouldn't trade it for the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, all right, so both of you have, your, your bodies of work are, are large, but they're, they're not only, um, I guess, capacious, but they're also very, very uh, uh, like broad in a sense. You're, you're both working not only as, as poets, but also as translators. Mm -hmm. um, Rosanna, I saw that you've, you've edited several collections. Um, so I guess I'm curious about how having that kind of a, a broad, uh, broad working aspect over time has, has influenced your poetry. And, and Peter and I are also both biographers. So we, we are um, working in multiple genres, um, which are demanding genres, as Peter knows. It took him years to, to write his biography of the German writer Adler. It took me years to write the Max Chacot biography. Um, uh, but um, um, what can I say? Uh, I under, anything I've undertaken was out of love for literature. And the poems grow up out of this huge mulch of, of other people's poems that I might be translating or the biography of someone, a, a poet, in my case, a French poet, I was writing and living in his soul and in his work and translating it and writing his life. Um, so it all felt like a form of fecundity to, to me. I don't know, Peter, how you feel about it. Yeah, no, it's, I mean, look, the, the gift is to immerse oneself in language. And as many different ways you get to do that, the, the better. Um, it's, um, and, you know, translation is an extension of my writing life. I, I get to write novels. I've never written a novel, but I, I get to shape and pen a novel, if you will, or several of them through translation. Uh, and writing a biography is, uh, you know, shaping a life and, and again, trying to tell somebody's story uh, or the story of their inner life. Uh, it, it's, it's all one continuum, I find. And, and there's only so many hours per day that you can immerse yourself in poems or only so many days per year. Um, you know, I can't remember who said it. Um, I, the, the poet gets up and, you know, works for two hours and then says, now what? Uh, well, <laughs> <laughs> there's there are more hours in, in the day so um it's uh, it, it's just part just part of the work of working with language in any way one can great um so this is mostly going to be a question for you peter but um rosanna you had also uh mentioned here and there uh that climate change is on your mind but um so I actually just started reading this book. Uh, this might be a weird thing to do, but uh, I started reading this book, which is by an, uh, an Icelandic author who prim primarily is a, an historian and writes about mythology. Huh? And the idea is that somebody asked him why he wasn't writing about climate change. And mm. his response was, oh, I don't really understand the science. I'm, I'm like a humanities guy. And uh, after thinking about it a little bit more, he decided to to kind of write around the idea, and the the metaphor that he uses in the introduction is that of uh, the photograph of the black hole, where mm. photographically you can't really um, resolve what's in the black hole because our cameras don't work that way. So the scientists have to image what's around the outside. Um, 
And he compared that to the way that the human mind thinks about climate change, where it's such an enormous problem that it's difficult for most people to, to really like keep it all in mind all at once. Um, so I guess I've just been thinking about different uh, artistic approaches to uh, nature and climate and that kind of thing. And I'm, yeah. I'm just kind of wondering how, how both of you approach that in terms of keep, keeping such a large idea in the mind and then like work, working with it. Uh, boy, am I glad you asked that question. That, um, that it, it is something that has really uh, begun to uh, interest me, um, dare I say even haunt me in recent years, because the, the climate is going to change so drastically and our relationship with nature is going to change so drastically. Having lived in the countryside my whole life, I take tremendous solace from the natural world and, and feel very grounded within it. But what happens when, when nature becomes almost pure nemesis because of the extremity of, of conditions of weather and, and the kind of, again, suffering that is going to be unleashed uh, upon uh, you know, the poorer regions of, of the earth and that we will be witness to it. So what do I do as a poet? Well, I, I, I'm trying to, at least in this book, trying to both face um, the, the ravages that are beginning to happen in the climate, something like false cardinal shows up three weeks early and, and that, that you know red sun setting at the end of that poem means it's going to be another hot day um, coming. Uh, I have a poem right next to it called Forecast, which is even bleaker uh, in its sort of long-term forecasts uh, for the climate. But then the other side, I think it's really important to try to write and acknowledge how wondrous and beautiful and rich and supple the natural world is. And, and there I come back. The, the poem I feel most guilty about in the collection is the hay poem, the making hay poem. Because I know that I, I'm no fool. I know that you know, uh, you know, cattle and hay and is you know part of the whole problem. But I don't want to live in the world where I don't love the smell of hay, um, or I'm going to have to find something else uh, to love. We have to we have to live and love in the world uh, as well. And I think that's the challenge. So I want to. I love that sense of the black hole, Devin, because I'm 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 trying to write around those edges, but all the edges, the tougher edges and the uh, more pleasurable edges as well. Yeah. Um, your question, I think, is, is uh, Devin, is about, partly it's about imagination, about what the human being simply cannot imagine. And our politics uh, around climate change are largely about refusing to imagine or the impossibility of imagining, and therefore the short-term dramas and problems and schemes and power plays occupy uh, most people's attention and resources. Um, so they can put it aside because it's just not convenient um, <laughs> to think about what you can't think about in a sense, most of us. Um, and yet it, the evidence is all around us. I mean, just look at online in the New York Times today that appalling climate map, if you've seen it, of the United States uh, since 1911. And every every year it's getting redder and redder and redder. And how, how can you ignore that, let alone what you just look out and see around you, um, whether it's more typhoons or more forest fires, et cetera, we can all make that list. Um, uh, but the, for the, I think for any topic, climate change or anything, the, the task of the poet is, uh, as Peter said, partly it is to be um, honoring language, honoring how language works um, and making it strange again, because we denature language by, by, um, by uh, ab abusing it, by constantly uh, you know, wearing it down with cliches. But our other task is imagination. It is to find the way to, to bring the, our imaginations al alive. Um, so I think that the poem is not a treatise or a, a scientific tract and it doesn't, it can't ignite the imagination that way. So I think that the oblique ways like Peter's Cardinal or Red Sun are, are the ways that you could might hope to catch someone's, catch someone's inner in soul 
the soul's attention. Um, so in my poem, my Anaximander poem, it's focused really very, it's very, if you were thinking cinematically, it's very close up to the plant Scylla and the single cardinal song. And then it's addressed to an unnamed you who's sick, but who has been working in Antarctica about, about ice. Um, and then from there, put that into tension with Anaximander's rather apocalyptic imagination about worlds disappearing. Um, that's just one poem in one way that came, it didn't, I didn't strategize ahead of time saying I'm going to write a poem about climate change, but um, it, it, it emerged from the elements that, uh, that I, I live with, um, if that's any help. But I do, I do think when I look at the politics of our country now, anytime, I think it's not entirely, but largely a problem of imagination, a, a problem of moral imagination. Can we imagine the pain of others? If we could, we might start doing something effective. <laughs> I, I will add, Devin, uh, seeing a book like that, we, you just go, to go back to your process question, when somebody, thank you. I mean, when somebody offers up a book like that, that's the kind of thing I'm going to make a beeline for. <laughs> and, um, yeah. because there's probably something to steal and make use of for it. Uh, it says maybe something one can find something. Uh, to start, like Rosanna is saying, uh, to start an act of imagination uh, in, in a poem, a lyrical, lyrical imagination. Yeah, that's a that's a uh, uh, a beautiful task for for all of us everywhere to stretch our imaginations. <laughs> you know. <laughs> uh, um, all right, so we're kind of rolling up onto seven here. Uh, so I think we're we're probably gonna gonna close it out but just uh you know just to wrap up here um if, if you're interested in in other events like this uh you can always go to greenapplebooks.com slash event and uh get a calendar of all the stuff we have happening and uh once again we've been talking with peter philkins whose uh most recent book is water slash music and Rosanna Warren, whose most recent book is So Forth. And that's it for the night. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Thanks, Rosanna. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, Thanks Peter. Peter. Thanks, Devin. Thank you both. Good night.